Now that you have a better, more clear understanding of weather, we're going to talk about weather services, which is the flight service station, as well as um, interpreting some of the weather charts. The flight service station is a service provided by our tax dollars, and they have different buildings located around the country, and their purpose is to give us weather briefings on the ground as well as in the air. They also will open, close, and file our flight plans. They will assist in search and rescue, and they also have the ability to find us if we're lost in the air as long as we have proper equipment in the airplane, which we'll discuss that at a different time. When you call 1-800-WX-BRIEF to obtain a legal weather briefing, they typically will start with the weather depiction chart. The weather depiction chart depicts widespread areas of IFR, marginal VFR, and VFR conditions. Your key is down here, and it says IFR, so anywhere you see a red dot, that's general conditions are IFR in that area. And remember, IFR is ceilings less than 1,000 feet, and or visibility is less than 3 miles. The marginal conditions are noted in blue dots, and marginal VFR, remember, is ceilings between 1 and 3,000, and visibility between 3 to 5 statute miles. And most recently, they started to add in these pink dots, which stands for low IFR. And the low IFR is ceilings less than 500 feet and or visibility less than one mile. Anywhere that no dot is depicted, it's complete VFR conditions, which means that the visibility is greater than five statute miles and the ceiling is greater than 5,000 feet. The next chart that they typically look at and give call, you know, to say the information over the phone to you is they will give you the synopsis. The synopsis, they're looking at the surface analysis chart to tell you where the highs and lows and different fronts are. Remember that high pressures typically bring good weather, blue skies, and the low pressure systems usually bring rain or uh, lower clouds. And here's an example of a cold front, and it's moving in a southeasterly direction. And over here, we see a stationary front where we have the uh, warm bubble indicated opposite of your cold front bubble. And here's an example of an occluded front where you have the point and the bubble on the same size, same side. And remember, the occluded front is uh, where you would most commonly find embedded thunderstorms. Over here we see where it looks like a stationary front, but there seems to be a big gap between the spacing of the blue point and the uh, red bubble. That means that a front line is just beginning to form. We talked earlier about the uh, ridges and troughs, and a ridge is associated with a high pressure system. And you can see where this high pressure system doesn't make a perfect circle, it's kind of elongated. So they may consider this area to be a ridge. It's where the high pressure area is kind of elongated or stretched out. But they do always show the troughs on the chart. The troughs are indicated by these orange hash marks. And that's where this low pressure system, which spins counterclockwise, has an elongated area of warmer rising air. The next chart that they would usually explain to you is this, the prognostic chart. The prognostic chart is where they're explaining the surface analysis chart's forecast. Where are these fronts and pressures expected to move over the next 12 hours or 24 hours? The area forecast covers several states. When they read the area forecast to you, they usually will break each state down into certain segments. For example, in South Carolina, we have the upstate or mountainous area and then we have the Piedmont area, and then we have the coastal waters. But they'll give you um, a broad idea of what the weather is in these areas, and you can use this as a filler where certain airports don't have the best weather reporting capability, then the area forecast gives you a, a general overview of the weather in those areas. This is a written area forecast. They're a little difficult to read because they leave the vowels out. Let's look down here at South Carolina. So in South Carolina, they've broken it down into mountains, Piedmont, and then coastal waters. In the mountainous area, they expect the forecast to be overcast at 3,000 feet, 
layered up to flight level 250, which is 25,000 feet. They expect those conditions to continue until 1500 Zulu, and after that it will be occasional 3 mile visibility with light rain and mist. And then they go on to tell you becoming between 16 and 1800, the sky is expected to be scattered at 3000, broken at 5000, and tops at 12,000. The outlook is VFR. It takes a little bit of practice uh, to read these charts, but you'll get used to it. The next chart they usually explain to you over the phone would be the radar summary chart. The radar summary chart is very helpful. Not only does it show us where precipitation is and the intensity, but it also shows us the tops of the clouds. In this area, the tops of those clouds are 40,000 feet. Here, 45,000 feet, and here, 50,000 feet. So those are pretty big storms. They also show us the direction of movement. This cell right here is moving to the southeast at six knots. This storm up here, the tops aren't very big, they only go to 20,000 feet, but it's moving very quickly across the ground at 43 knots to the north-northeast. This chart they don't usually explain to you over the phone, but I like to look at this one on my own on a website called IntelliCast. The uh, darker areas shows me where the dry area is. So if I'm flying this particular day and the weather gets worse, I always know where my way out is. I want to know where better weather is when I make my journeys. This is just another example of a type of radar that you could find on the internet. Air mats, sigmats, and convective sigmats we had covered earlier, but just as a reminder, your air mats are moderate weather that have nothing to do with thunderstorms. And you can see here where they talk about IFR conditions and mountain obscuration and moderate icing and moderate turbulence. In this area, they're reporting moderate or expecting uh, moderate turbulence from the surface up to 18,000 feet. If there were two peaks on this, that would be severe turbulence and it would fall under a sigmat. Now this sigmat, it's also going to cover convective sigmats as well. And I don't see any sigmats that would be severe turbulence or severe icing or volcano ash or dust storms, but there are a few convective sigmats. In red, these are thunderstorms that are occurring right now. The yellow is considered a convective outlook. That means that it's an area where there's potential for thunderstorms to build up. These are winds, winds and temperature aloft forecasts. You can look at it in either a picture format or you can look at it in a more uh, text format. And in the text format, in our area, the winds aloft at um, GSP, which is the uh, Greenville Spartanburg International Airport, Greer, under the 3,000 foot column, it's telling us that the winds are out of 250 at 12 knots. And then at 6,000 feet, the winds are out of 240 at 18 knots. And then they also start giving us the temperature aloft the temperature at 6,000 feet is plus 5 degrees. At 9,000 feet, the winds shift just a little more out of the west. The winds are out of 260 at 28, and the temperature is zero. So when I look at the temperature difference between 6,000 and 9,000, and remember my standard lapse rate is 2 degrees per thousand feet, I would expect a drop of 6 degrees but the temperature only dropped 5 degrees, so this air is a little more stable than standard. If we look at the picture format of the winds aloft, they use flag symbols to denote the speed of the wind and also the direction. When the, the flag is denoting uh, the speed by allowing you to see that a long hash is worth 10 and a half hash is worth 15. So if we look at this one right here, for example, or this one, I see a long hash worth 10 and a short hash worth 5. So the wind is coming from the northwest at 15 knots. Up here in the Canadian area, uh, we see filled in triangles. A filled in triangle is worth 50 knots. If we look at this one, this is 40 knots because I have four long hashes. Each hash is uh, equal to 10 knots. You can also see 
um, from the direction of the wind, how the wind circles. And this must be a low pressure in this area because when I look at the wind flags, it's, uh, I meant to say high pressure. It has to be a high pressure here because looking at those wind flags, the air is circling clockwise, which that's the way the winds circle around a high pressure system. Now hopefully you got a legal weather briefing before you went out to pre-flight the aircraft. But you may also get an update of weather once you're flying along. And the different ways that you can get an update of weather along your route, uh, you can call Flight Service Station, you can call EFAS, which is also known as Flight Watch, uh, you can listen to IWAS or Tweeb, and you can get a, listen to the Center Weather Advisories. You can also ask the air traffic controllers um, for any updates and weather that they might know along your route. Um, you may want to update in weather because you see thunderstorms building off in the distance, and maybe you're concerned that they're building, or you want to know which way are they moving, uh, so you can better plan to go around them. Uh, you may want to know what the winds are above or below you because you're looking for a better tailwind, or perhaps you're just interested if the weather's changed at your destination. So there's many reasons you want to may want to update of weather along your route. Um, first, I want to explain the flight service station a little bit and explain their job. The flight service station are facilities located around the United States, and the people in the building monitor several different frequencies. And the, the different frequencies range from, uh, there's a 122.62, there's a 122.2, there's a 1, 2, 3, point 6. There's many different frequencies. You don't have to memorize them. They're available on the charts, and I'll explain in a moment um, how you find those frequencies and how you address the flight service station. But the flight service station, they also always monitor the mating frequency, 1, 2, 1 1.5. And then they have some frequencies that um, end with an R, 1, 2, 1 1.1 with an R. Now, if you wanted to call the flight service station while you're flying along, what you want to do is look at your uh, sectional chart and find a compass rose that goes along with the VORs. So wherever you find a compass rose, you'll look at the information box that goes with that, the VOR box. And let's say, for example, it was a Greenwood, Golf Romeo Delta, and they would have the Morse code for that airport and um, there may be a, a name below that. And in this area in South Carolina, uh, Anderson Flight Service Station covers this area. If you were in North Carolina, then uh, Raleigh Flight Service Station covers that area, and in Georgia it's Macon. But there are different names for different areas. But this is how you would address the Flight Service Station is by this name that you see underneath. So you address them as Anderson Radio or Raleigh Radio or make in radio. You say the name of the facility and follow it by radio. And then on the top of the box you would see one, of, one or more of these frequencies. So let's say for example you saw 122.2. So how you would do this is on your communication radio you just simply put in, let's say this is your COM1, you simply put in 122.2 and you call the flight service station, Anderson Radio, Cessna 4642 Juliet, uh, 3,000 feet, 5 miles east of the Greenwood VOR, listening on 122.2. So when you call them, you tell them who you are and you want to tell them where you are and tell them how you're listening to them because they have a lot of frequencies to monitor and if you tell them what frequency you're listening to them on, they can get back to you a lot quicker. Uh, the next thing is you may find this string frequency above the VOR box. So let's say they also have this frequency, 121.1 with an R. Now this one's a little bit different. You, it involves using your navigation as well. And how this works, let's say this is your nav1 for example. Um, how this one works with the R is the flight service station receives you on that frequency, but they have to transmit back across the VOR. So uh, Greenwood's frequency is 115.5. So what you would do is you put the 121.1 into your communication radio, and in your nav radio you would have to put the 15.5 in there. And then on the top, on your audio panel, select your uh, nav 1, if that's where you place the frequency, and be sure to turn the volume up. 
And then how you would address them is you would say, Anderson Radio, Cessna 4642 Juliet, 5,000 feet over Greenwood VOR, listening on the Greenwood VOR 115.5. And that way they will know, they will see that you're talking to them on 121.1, but they will know to transmit back to you across that VOR frequency. But again, don't forget to select it on your audio panel, and don't forget to turn the uh, nav up so they can hear you. Now the flight service station has many jobs. Um, they open and close and file flight plans. They help with search and rescue, and you know they can give weather and route and other things like that. And once somebody's worked for the flight service station for a period of time, they basically test up to a higher level of understanding of weather, and they're allowed to work for EFIS. So EFIS is, uh, I'll give them a two-story building, since uh, they kind of graduated up to that privilege. And EFIS has a, another name called Flight Watch, so you may, uh, you typically address them as Flight Watch in the air. And the neat thing about um, the Flight Watch is that the frequency is only one frequency, 122.0, and that frequency may be used anywhere in the United States. It's also supposedly guaranteed between 5,000 feet up to 18,000 feet. So all you have to do is just know one frequency and you can just address them as Flight Watch. So you may say Flight Watch Cessna 4642 Juliet 7500 over the Columbia VOR and then the nearest Flight Watch will talk back to you. So it might be Atlanta Flight Watch or Jacksonville Flight Watch or something similar to that. Um, but the Flight Watch has a higher level of understanding of the weather. So they may give you a better uh, breakdown or interpretation of the weather. And Flight Watch would be my first choice to call if I needed an update in weather. And what that does is it gives me the best information, plus it frees up the flight service station for all the other jobs that they have to do. But certainly, if you could not raise uh, Flight Watch, definitely call the flight service station and they will help you out and give you an update in weather. Now, the HIWAS and the Tweeb, um, sometimes on the VORs, you will see in the top right corner a little circle that has either a H or a T. And HIWAS is Hazardous In-Flight Weather Advisory Service. It's a continuous broadcast. You don't talk to them, you just listen to it. It's a continuous broadcast of any airmats, segments, or convective segments in the area. And Tweeb is basically the same thing, but it stands for Transcribed Weather and Route Broadcast. Uh, I've never seen a tweed, somebody said there was one in Alaska, but they're basically the same thing. You just uh, dial in the frequency and uh, turn the volume up, you know, select it on your, your audio panel, turn the volume up, and you can listen to it. The high bosses are a little bit difficult to understand because they give the position of the weather in relation to VORs. So, for example, they may say that there's a convective segment, you know, for thunderstorms, they may say there's a convective segment uh, two zero miles south of this facility, extending one five miles west of Gulf, uh, Charlie Alpha Echo up through, and they'll give the position in relation to different VORs. Well, if you're familiar with the VORs, it's not quite so difficult to understand, but if you're flying in an area where you, you're not familiar with those VORs, it's a bit difficult to understand. Um, the Center Weather Advisory is when the air traffic or air route traffic control center just advises, uh, openly advises of any air mat segments and convective segment. Anything that's significant to the pilot right now, that you know it's a dangerous weather, then they just automatically broadcast it even though you didn't ask for it. Air route traffic control center. So the ARTC is what we call them, and we nickname them the center, just with that last C. So air route traffic control center the center will just basically blurt out any hazardous weather, and they call it a center weather advisory. Um, also, ATC, the air traffic controllers, whether it be the center or um, one of the approach frequencies, such as Greer Approach or Columbia Approach or Asheville Approach, um, most of those guys have pretty decent radar weather ability, and so you could certainly ask them if they see any weather along your route. And some of them can tell you just that there is weather there, and some of them can tell you the level of intensity of that weather, or uh, how much precipitation that it might have with it. So these are the different services that are available for obtaining in-route weather. 
And uh, keep yourself safe. Don't be afraid to call and uh, get an update whenever you need it. And happy flying.